Okay, good morning everyone and thank you for joining us for this webinar titled Managing Virtual Teams, Key Tips and Tricks. This webinar will be presented by Manager Mechanics' very own Eric Bloom. Uh, my name is Brian Duncan, I'll be your MC for the event. What that means is that I can help uh, coordinate any questions that you might have for Eric, so please put those in the chat box or the questions box in the bottom right corner, the go to, go to webinar bar on the right. Um, this, this webinar is presented overall by New Horizons, a proven worldwide training provider with flexible learning solutions covering a broad spectrum of products taught by industry leading instructors. And with that being said, I will go ahead and pass it over to Eric to present for all of you today. Hi, Brian. Thank you for uh, the introduction. And of course, thank you to New Horizons for uh, sponsoring this, which is, by the way, for all, a monthly webinar that uh, that we do together so uh, if you've been on some of my previous monthly webinars welcome back uh, if this is your first uh, we have others coming uh, moving ahead uh, about this time every month it can be found on the New Horizons website but uh, again my name is Eric Bloom I'm the uh, president and CTO of manager mechanics I'm a former CIO as you can see I won't read my whole bio but with about 25 years of experience uh, author of various books shown here, and a new one I'm excited to say coming out uh, in about three weeks called Productivity Driven Success. If my name is familiar to you, is I write for both IT World as well as CIO.com with the title shown here. <clears throat> in addition to speaking, uh, uh, in addition to training, uh, I'm also the immediate past president of National Speakers Association. So welcome, and now uh, just full content, enough about me, the rest of it's all about you. I'm really excited about this class on managing virtual teams. The reason is is that uh, what you're going to get in the next 50 minutes or 55 minutes, which is uh, going to be a little bit like drinking out of a fire hose, what they are is they're excerpts from actually a full day class on um, virtual teams that we're offering uh, online through OLL on uh, March 24th. Uh, also, this is one of the 10 topics contained in our I, uh, ITMLP, IT Management Leader, Leadership Professional Boot Camp, we're doing uh, next week. I think next week's is sold out. You might check. Maybe there's a seat left or they'd make a special spot for you. But that three-day class will be offered again in February 23rd, 24th, and 25th. But uh, anyway, is that you're going to see we're jamming lots of information into the next 55 minutes. So sit back, hold, uh, hold your seats, and take lots of notes. The first thing that I want to start with <clears throat> is, man it is the challenges of managing virtual teams. Effectively, what this is, is this is setting the mood. <clears throat> oh, excuse me, I'm fighting off a little bit of an allergy. I promise I won't give it to you. But, uh, but anyway, this is setting the mood. Of, you, know, you say, well, you know, I manage teams that are all in one place. What's the difference if I manage them at distance? For those on the line who have managed them from distance, then you pretty much know the uh, you know what these next couple of slides are going to say. And then from there, we go into all sorts of cool stuff you can do with it. The first thing is all man uh, all virtual teams run into these issues. What they are is by consistency of team stakeholder vision. If you have people working for you in four different cities, you may or may not know their bosses, the other projects that they're working on for business users at other locations, etc. So as you know, if, it's hard enough to know that stuff when you're all in one location. But as it's virtual, it becomes harder and harder to make sure that the stakeholders of the people working for you and the stakeholders of your project, if they're in multiple locations, all believe the same thing. Because if they don't, if they think that you have someone full time, but they only want to have you have that person half time, if this is a major priority for you and uh, something to do when they have time uh, on the other side, it can derail, derail your project. So the communication with your stakeholders to assure um, to assure that they're on board with what you're doing is paramount to your success. Other things is defining efficient processes. Uh, let's say I'll pick on Brian who introduced me. If he and I are in cubes right next to each other and there's a process that I work on and I give it to him, well, if I don't do a good job or if I do it in a way that uh, it would be easier for him if I did something differently, then he can just lean over the cube and say, hey, Eric, do it that way. But if they're uh, in different cities, you know, different miles away, or different tens of thousands of miles away, uh, is that that becomes a much, much more difficult process to do. So as the manager, you have to drive it. Next is um, assessing team member competence. 
it's hard enough to do that when everyone is you know physically there and you can watch them work but it becomes more and more difficult when they're at distance and that changes the way the projects need to be provided for them team cohesion is how do you get everyone to feel like a team if they're in multiple locations and lastly how do you build trust these are all things that the co-located teams are required co-located meaning all in one place but it just becomes more difficult the next set is minimizing work fragmentation say that I'm working on there are three things to do I'm working on two of them and Brian is working on two of them uh, you know what is two and two is four we only have three things to do that means that the two of us are working on the same project or, uh, or the same piece or the other side of it is let's say that we're working in Java and uh, I'm developing uh, functions and he's developing software that's going to call my functions I develop those functions as pass by value and he creates the programs that are going to use them as pass by reference so what happens is these are difficulties we probably would have found if we were working together physically the next is team member isolation this one's huge. What happens is, is if you have one person working in Des Moines and other people at other locations, how do you know that that person in Des Moines is engaged? Or if you are that person in Des Moines, how do you, what can you do to feel more part of the group? Do you know what the number one leading indicator is for job satisfaction? Actually, for job satisfaction and reduced attrition, it's having friends at work. Other issues are how do you assess them from a performance perspective and assure they're, they're contributing, and how do you do success uh, across multiple locations? I'll give you a quick one on this. I know I'm, I'm basically, if this starts by telling you all the issues, but I'll give you a good tip right here, is what I do is I had a team working for me in Boston, Washington, and Miami, uh, and all three of those are obviously East Coast U.S., so what I did was is that uh, I think it was the Miami team did a really good thing. So what did I do is I called a lunchtime meeting at all three locations, called the Domino's Pizza near each location, had pizza in, put people on video. So we all got to share the success of the uh, that, uh, that the Florida team was able to do. Helps build camaraderie, other things along that line. So the, the moral of that story is be creative. Now, moving forward, not only these, which are all virtual teams, <clears throat> but then if you're in multiple time zones, things get trickier. It's finding the right times. When can you meet? You know, the rule, I like to call it the rule of least inconvenience. You know, uh, when, when are the times when you can meet that make sense for everybody? And the farther the time frames are apart, the harder it is. I'll give you an example of this. And by the way, what I mean by the least inconvenience is better you have someone on at 7 at night rather than 2.30 in the morning. An example of that is I was doing a, uh, a, a set of webinars for a, a client in, um, uh, in Singapore. Well, I'm in Boston, so Singapore is a 12-hour difference. So I said, well, all right, I'll do it under the condition that we do it in the morning, their time. So 7 to 9, I'm sorry, uh, 9 to 11, their time is uh, a.m. is 9 to 11 p.m. my time. You know, it's a little late in the evening, but that's okay. I could do that. So then what happens is the week before, you know, there's a little uh, couple of meetings. There's a scheduling, and they drop me an email. Oh, sorry about that. We changed the meeting from morning to afternoon. So instead of being 9 to 11 a.m., it's going to be 1 to, 1 to 3 o'clock p.m. Hope this isn't an inconvenience. Well, what that meant was I had to be on video, all nice and perky, at 1 to 3 in the morning. Um, you know, it, uh, is it, as you can imagine, it wasn't particularly comfortable. And then after being all charged and in a two-hour webinar for a client, is then at five minutes past three, I'm trying to go to sleep. Well, you can see where that one headed. That was not taking advantage of the rule of least inconvenience. They, uh, they're, the, they're the client, so of course I did it. But, it was, but if that was employees of yours and you, you were current, continually doing that kind of thing to them, most likely they'll do what, uh, what most unhappy employees do and they vote with their feet and find new jobs. Next is cultural differences. Now, cultural differences, for a moment here, I'm not going to speak about international. We're going to talk about that one separately. But what I mean by here is it could be the corporate office is very process oriented and is really into ITIL and waterfall methodology, et cetera. However, the field offices or the field divisions or, um, or smaller companies owned by the central corporation, that kind of thing, uh, they're very much using agile. 
So what happens is these these kind of cultural differences, or it could be well, it's political season. So you know, say Texas could be very uh, conservative. I'm from Massachusetts, classically thought of as very liberal. So as a result, there could be clashes of that type. But here I'm talking more in the, the business realm. So an example of this one could be is that uh, it could be risk oriented. It could be uh, you know I'm more let's say that I'm more willing to take on. Um, additional risk, which means when I go to, to hire a vendor, I'm willing to do it for time and materials because I think it can save us money. Say you, for example, may uh, say being much more conservative, might say, you know, a risk averse, might say, you know what, I'd rather spend a little bit more money, get it on um, fixed bid contract, so therefore we know what our downside risk is. Neither one of those are right or wrong. They're just different. <clears throat> Next is on top of all that, on top of the standard stuff that hits us, uh, on top of time zone differences, and just general business culture and working differences, then what you also have on top of all that are international, con uh, international related uh, um, issues. For example, here language. You know, uh, we'll talk about mitigated speech and other things a little bit later, but I'll give you an example of this is that uh, I didn't say the company was, I was at. I was primarily financial services up to a CIO role, and I also had a very senior IT position over at Monster.com. When I was at Monster, I had a big group working for me in Prague, and my manager there said, uh, this should be really easy to do. And I said to him, great, sounds like a piece of cake. And he paused for a minute and said, when did you start talking about food? And I said, I'm not talking about food. He says, yeah, you're talking about food. I said, when did I start talking about food? And he says to me, he says, I told you the project was going to be easy and you start talking about cake. And what that is, is those are, that's a colloquialism based on the U.S. from a book written in the early 1900s uh, related to pleasantries. So that, that's the, you know, the kind of communication issues you have country to country. And again, by the way, there's no right or wrong here. Is only different. Uh, certain countries uh, don't have intellectual property laws. So as a result of that, you have to be very, very careful on the type of information or where you physically store your, uh, your data. Holiday schedules. Uh, like, for example, let's say that it was the 4th of July and you have, you're working for a group that's based in England. Well, does England have, uh, you know, that, how would you feel about that if you had to spend your 4th of July uh, holiday day in a full day meeting with your company. You wouldn't be too happy. Well, you know what? Other countries have holidays also, so let's be careful not to do it to them. Well, for example, using that, does London have, uh, does uh, England have the 4th of July? Actually, they do have the 4th of July. They just don't celebrate it as a holiday. Sorry, I had to get one in. <laughs> but uh, anyway, so as a manager of a virtual team or as a member of a virtual team, these are the kind of things that you run into on an ongoing basis. Now, the next thing that you have to consider, you know, we've, we've laid that foundation. What we're doing here now is we're going to be talking about different ways to, uh, to assess your team. Because like all things is that there isn't one type of virtual team. There are multiple types. Some are new, some are old, some are in transition, some are doing well, some are doing badly. And how you manage that team will, will, uh, will have a great, imp or what that team is, as shown here, will have a great impact on how you manage them effectively. It is not one size fits all. So it's said here, it's big blue letters. Anyone who's been on webinars with me previously knows that, well, I always read it to you pretty much when it's very, very big letters. The best way a virtual team should be led is very dependent on the team's responsibilities, need for interlocation communication, <clears throat> the maturity of the team, and lastly, its composition. So let's talk about each of these pieces individually. First, what this is, is this is a diagram that going across the bottom is the difficulty of the task being performed. Vertically, it's the level of interaction between the different physical locations. Now, for the, what I'd like those of you to do on, uh, you know, who joined me today, is think of this, as we go through this section, think about where you fit within it. 
So the way this works, and by low complexity, please forgive me in the bottom left, I actually used to work on the help desk, but by, by, uh, by low complexity, certainly there are some very technical issues the help desk deals with, but what I'm thinking is, is that uh, it could be changing printers, it could be moving machines, sort of that level of it as opposed to you know, the much more, much more technical issues that they, uh, that they deal with. But anyway, in some cases, <clears throat> you'll have low complexity and low interaction. By interaction, that means is that the help desk people in Boston probably don't talk too much to the to specifically to the people doing help desk in the LA office or the Chicago office. Over to the right is uh, increasing with low interaction if you have multiple data centers. Certainly, that would be very complex by its nature, uh, but still, the data centers, except on interface issues, probably don't talk much. Moving it up to the top where there's heavy interaction, customer service, the tasks aren't all that necessarily difficult. You know, it's helping clients, maybe logins or, uh, you know, how to buy products or whatever. However, is that the interaction is very, very high. Let me transfer you to X and you have to have different equipment for that. And in the bottom right where it's high both is that uh, like scientific research, as you'll see that there's an amount of autonomy that's needed between each. Each of these four boxes, and think where your group resides, has different ways that that team has to be managed. <clears throat> For example, with, um, uh, with low interaction uh, between the teams and a lower complexity, what does that mean? That each team works autonomously. Well, that makes sense because it's low interaction. But as a result of that, the vision, the directions, and the cross-location standards need to be driven from above. Next is, is that if it's low interaction but high complexity, there still needs to be a, a high level of, auto of, of autonomy in each one of the sites because they're, they're working on their own behalf. However, probably because of the level of, of complexity and the high level of interface between groups, is that then probably, you probably should set up standardized meetings or standardized processes to talk multiple locations. <clears throat> Excuse me, the third. High interaction and low complexity, like customer service. Here, basically, is that uh, you need to have great standards, but also efficient communication and data flow across your different locations. And lastly, high interaction and high complexity, they need to not only be autonomous to be able to drive their own creativity, but there has to be some standard processes in place for them to interact on an ongoing basis. So there's sort of a lot more than that. Again, everything I'm showing you is an excerpt of our full day class and, uh, and the, the, an expanded version of it, not the full day, but an expanded version of this is not three day MLP. But I'm, I'm hoping you get the idea of that. Think of the one that works with you. <clears throat> Next, what's the status of your team? Is it a brand new team? Uh, whereas you're saying, gee, all right, I'm pulling five people together. I've hired two people in Boston, one in LA, two in Chicago. Uh, one in uh, Miami Beach. Now, that's very different from a team that you have where you have six people, say, physically located with you uh, in one location, and then all of a sudden one starts working from home, you hire another person in Denver, et cetera. So that's sort of a transitional team where you're migrating. In that case, you know, with the first one, if you start up as a virtual team, then what happens is, is all of the, the cultural things, the communication, all of that starts at where everyone is in multiple locations. But if you're in one location and then start bridging out to have people in multiple, you actually have to change your department's culture to have them remember that people are at distance and to convert them in and change your processes. Because you can't just walk into a staff meeting and hand out uh, um, and hand out the agenda anymore. You have to remember now to email it to the people at distance so they can look at it or print it off before the meeting starts. Little things, but you know they add up to a lot of logistics. And lastly, like all departments, a new manager would take over. <clears throat> How's it doing? Is it running really well? Well, has some issues or not going so well. So all of those things and the rules and the amount of change that's required in a regular team also would have to happen in a virtual team, but it would have to be much more thought out, particularly from a communication perspective. Next, your teams can pause it. Pause it is a really, what this one is, is that where are the people? 
you know, in the first one, what it is, is this is typical where you have multiple offices. So I'll go back to the help desk scenario, where the people are virtual, but they're collective in groups. So uh, with help desk, you have, say, uh, five people in Boston, five in Denver, five in San Jose. So now with that, is that uh, as far as isolation, they may individually not feel isolated. Why? Because they're physically located as a location with three or four other people that they work with. So as a result, individual um, isolation is not an issue. However, do the, does the team overall feel like they're getting good direction, good input, getting appropriate visit as a team to you, the manager at the corporate office? So these are, this is an example of different ways that you have to deal with it based on your particular group. The next is, do you have individual, uh, remote individuals? <clears throat> so in other words, is that, uh, let's say wherever your corporate headquarters is, is that you have five people working for you in different locations. My company manager mechanics, uh, I'm in Massachusetts. I have a trainer that's up in New Hampshire. I have another trainer that's in another part of Massachusetts. Uh, my, uh, my accounting person is in Vermont. So we're working very, very virtually. So what happens is, is that I have to make sure that none of the members of my team feel isolated. Like, oh, what am I working with Eric for when we could be doing other things? And then what happens in most cases with virtual teams is that you end up having a mix of the top two of clusters and individuals. So you have some that are in groups and some that are individuals, and you can't treat them all the same. The one that's the individual, you may want to call them a little bit more often. And, um, you know, just to make sure that they're doing okay. <clears throat> Sorry about that. Is, uh, uh, anyway, is you have to make sure that the groups, you may be con communicating with them from a, uh, uh, you know, a staff meeting perspective. But then you get on the phone once in a while with the individual person. Give them a little bit more attention. And then lastly, the same thing that goes for employees goes for vendors. So, you know, do you have a, uh, a group of vendors working for you that are off-site? Or do you have, like, for example, a lot of the, uh, the Indian outsourcing models work that way, where you'll have a few people on-site working with you physically, uh, and then what they do is they handle the relationship of the offshore programmers. And again, none of these are right or wrong. All of these scenarios can go very, very well or very, very poorly, <clears throat> depending on your ability to lead the team. Now, if you listen to anything all day long, this is a very, very important key concept for you that works for managing virtual teams, running meetings, which is actually what our next topic is on, virtual meetings, uh, or any one of the other things here, public speaking, giving presentations. Uh, if, if, if you give webinars, it's, well, like I am now. Is, and what that is, is when you see great things, when you're in meetings, with people who run a great meeting. Think of it in your office location now. <clears throat> Whereas you get some people who sit back and, and they just run great meetings. And you say, oh, good, it's Joe's meeting. And uh, I love going to Joe's meeting because you know what? We always end on time. We seem to get through the agenda. It goes well. <clears throat> and talk with other people. You go to other meetings and it's, oh, no, uh, uh, Brian, I'm going to throw you under the bus on this one. Oh, no, I'm going to Brian's meeting. Oh. You know, we'll have five things on the agenda. We'll be lucky if we get through the first one. We'll be waylaid with other topics. Well, the thing is, when you're in meetings with very, very good people like Joe, or, sorry, Brian, very, very bad meeting managers like, uh, like Brian, then he's, he's really good at this stuff. That's why I can pick on him, by the way. But anyway, is uh, learn from them. Don't just be a participant in the meeting. Certainly go there, do what you have to do, take notes, participate in everything. But in addition to a participant, be an observer. In other words, what makes Joe's meetings run really, really well? And Brian's meetings, not so much. If you're enjoying this webinar, or even hopefully you are, but even if you're not, observe, what am I doing here? I'm changing slides a lot. Uh, I'm trying to use lots of energy, etc. You know, to say, if, you, if you get off and say, wow, Eric gave a really good webinar, think, think to yourself, what did he do? How did he do it? And then what that will do is whether on any of the things on this list here, leading conference calls, meetings, giving presentations, public speaking, negotiation, etc., is that you can improve your own craft by, again, not just being a participant, but observing what's going on. 
So tying this back now to your virtual meetings, <clears throat> if there is a specific meeting, uh, a specific person who runs a great conference call uh, or a great webinar or just manages his or her team really, really well, then what, I, what you should do is you should try to watch their technique. How do they do it? What did they do? You say, wow, I really felt engaged in this meeting. The next question, the next thing you should say to yourself is why did I feel engaged? And then from there, regardless of the topic, that's why this is certainly very appropriate to our topic today on managing virtual teams, but this particular concept transcends all of the topics shown here. Sorry for being so passionate and talking about it so long, but I really want you to get this one. And quite frankly, this has been enormous help to me both as a business person, uh, as a, uh, in, when I was in an IT role, as well as I was learning business and how to do, quite frankly, what I'm doing right now. <clears throat> now let's change topics. And now let's talk about manage, specific techniques to, manage, to, uh, to, um, to managing, or I should say running virtual meetings and best practices. <clears throat> First, is if you're a newbie, to running uh, to leading teams either via conference call or you know you've always done it with people in the same room you have participated in them but now you're going to be running these meetings which is part of the reasons I'm thinking you might be on the call but anyway is that with that what happens is is like all things in life running a good virtual meeting is a lot harder than it looks so practice you know practice at first if you can on basically less important or less risky type scenarios. Another thing you can do is, you know, ask to join a virtual team, uh, a virtual team meeting that's being held somewhere in your company. You know, is that hopefully you'll be able to participate if it's something at least marginally related to what you do for work. Or if not, just listen and observe the speaker and see how they do it. Or attend a free interactive webinar, sort of like this one actually. This one is mostly talk, which by the way, remember if anybody has questions, I love questions on stuff like this. So uh, please feel free to enter them into the, uh, enter them into the box <clears throat> and uh, Brian will uh, either ask him at the end uh, or if it's pertinent to a particular slide, he obviously has permission to, uh, to interrupt me at any time. Give me one second here. I just have to have a drink of my tea. Thank you. Technique for you, by the way, if you're going to drink your tea or something like that, remember to hit the mute button. Uh, anyway, next is, um, you know, attend a free webinar. Or like, for example, we're doing right now. If you're giving presentations via webinar, some of the tricks. You'll see that I'm changing screens very often. Uh, I'm doing my best to keep my energy up for this whole hour to, keep, to make sure that you can, uh, can follow along and that I'm keeping your interest. Now, because when you're on a conference call or given a webinar is, uh, oh, Mary, yep, don't use your email right now. Now I'm just kidding. I don't even know if there's anyone named Mary on the line. But uh, there's a lot of things going on against you when you're running a virtual meeting. People are multitasking as an example of that. If you have five people on the call, whoops, I think I'm losing you here for a sec. Let me try this. I don't know why it seemed like I cut out for a sec. Okay, that's better is uh, if you have um, five people in a room and you have one person at distance, is that sometimes you forget that they're on the conference call. You know, they're on the, um, uh, oh, what's it called, the uh, speaker phone in the, middle of the, uh, in the middle of the desk and you forget they're there. Also, people run out of batteries. There's interruptions. People walk into people's offices, time zones. Handouts have to be mailed ahead of time. You know, these are all the things you don't have to worry about if everybody's sitting in the same room. So just recognize this, and then what you want to try to do is minimize the effect of these different related issues. Next is um, ideas to help you run smoothly. Well, we talked about a lot of this, you know, the issues that were going on. But now let's, for example, talk about some particular items. This is one of my favorite, the first one. If the majority of the participants are together in the, in the conference call, that was the one that was here. That's the second one I'm talking about. People in the conference room forget people are on the phone. 
<clears throat> then what you do is take a piece of paper, fold it like a tent kind of thing, and then put it next to the speakerphone or on, probably not on the speakerphone because you don't want to muffle it. But let's say, for example, that five of us are in, are in a room together and Brian is connecting remotely from uh, New Horizons headquarters. What I would do is I would write Brian on, a, on both sides of like a little tent card and I would put it right next to the speakerphone. That way when I'm talking to Joe sitting across the room from me, I, I will see Brian's name, which not only reminds me what his name is, but it also is a visual cue to me that Brian or others are on the call. It's just a nice way of remembering that people are, uh, that people are, involved, that people are involved on the call. Next is periodically ask questions of people on the phone, just to make sure that they're paying attention. Now, I'm going to give you a trick here. There's two ways to do this. Let's say, uh, for example, is, as I'll use Brian as the example again. <clears throat> Let's say, boy, Brian, I feel really bad. You know, Brian's a really great guy, but I keep using him in all the bad examples. So I'm going to use Joe instead of Brian because I don't want him to be mad at me. But uh, anyway, so let's say that I don't think that Joe is paying attention. By the way, if there's someone on the call named Joe, I apologize. We have a ton of people on the call today, and I, I haven't shot through the list. So no, no, no harm, no foul. How's that? But anyway, so I don't think Joe's paying attention. There are two ways that I can call him out on that. One thing I could say is I could say, well, anyway, this is a really important topic. What do you think, Joe? Now, if Joe had, was not paying attention, then what's he going to have to say to me? He's going to say, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, Eric, could you repeat the question? Which is basically Joe's way then of telling me and everyone else, hey, I wasn't paying attention. I need you to tell me again. Now, that, that can be sort of mean. Particularly, I wouldn't want to do that if Joe was my boss. So the other way that I could call him out is I could say, uh, now on this next topic, oh, you know what? Hey, Joe, um, uh, I, I, I'm really hoping that you can give me some thoughts on it at the end of this, uh, at the end of this particular topic. Would that, be, would that be all right with you? And then here's Joe, huh? Oh, I'm saying Joe. Basically, I'm, saying, I'm basically saying, hey, Joe, pay attention. I'm going to ask you a question in a minute. So that way, um, it's a more polite way to call him back in. He heard his name. So I said, so anyway, Joe, is uh, this next topic I know is one that you're interested in. I'd love to get your feedback at the end. Blah, 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 blah. Hey, Joe, what do you think? Because that way, I'm not calling him out. So the first one, what's it also going to tell everybody else on the call? Say they all report to me. Wow, did you see what Eric just did to Joe? Uh, I better be paying attention. So these are the, the nuances to look for. Uh, next is, is what you want to do is if it's not a confidential call, turn off the beep. Because otherwise, people are coming in, people are going out, you're always hearing beep. And then last one, this one's very, very important. Let's say we're not, but let's say that Brian and I uh, were trying to sell you something. And you're individually on there is the client that we are, or the prospective client we're trying to sell. Well, in a meeting, when you, if, if Brian and I were physically in the same room, then we could look over at each other like, yeah, that went well. All right, more. Talk about more of that. You know, like the, the, the subtle body language that people can do within a meeting if they know each other, you know, on continuing, talk faster, talk slower, et cetera. Well, you can't do that in a webinar. So what we could do, though, is we could use texting. We could both have our email up, some type of instant messenger, where basically we can have a back channel to talk to each other. So let's say that you and one of the people that you work with at another location is making a presentation to your, combi you know, to your, to your boss. It's set up a back channel between the two of you so that you can uh, communicate without it going over the main presentation channel. Other things, uh, assure that, <clears throat> that everyone on the call has a chance to speak. Now again, this is conference, this is conference call as opposed to webinar. But uh, remember, by the way, uh, speaking of speaking, anyone who has any questions, please feel, uh, please feel free to type them in, and Brian will cut me off, or uh, will uh, you know, ask the questions as, uh, as required. Well, as you say that, Eric, there's a couple in here, so I'll just go ahead and send them out there for you, and you can answer them, okay? Please do. Okay. Please do. The first one is, um, can you uh, use Agile with virtual team? Great question. The answer is yes, you can, but it's a lot harder than doing it if everyone's in the same place. What I would say is that if you're going to use Agile, uh, then your morning um, scrum, you know, scrum meeting becomes extremely important. What I would say also is if possible, do it on video. Uh, you know, even if it's just Skype, something like that. You know, it doesn't have to be fancy. Just make sure you're not breaking any company rules by going outside the firewall. 
But, um, but yes, you can do it, but it's a lot more difficult. The communication must be much heavier. What you might want, you know, the, um, uh, yeah, use video for it and so on. The other thing you may want to do uh, is you may want to use text from everybody's desk you know, to set up like uh, sort of like the uh, a discussion board or, um, you know, just an instant messenger where everybody's on it kind of together. Uh, the reason being is, is that that can enhance the, uh, the interday communication. But great, great question. Uh, and you said you had a second one, Brian? Uh, it's not really a question, more of a, a, com a statement with a question in it, kind of. Um, no question, but our department has now grown tremendously. And we now do uh, service services statewide and we do call in staff meetings right now and looking for a better way. Do they tend to come into the office because the calls are terrible? Um, do you have any recommendations other than just calls? Uh, again, I'm going to turn to video. You know, is that the reason that I, I'm pushing video here is when people interact, and I'm going to say something else regarding process, um, but what happens is when, when humans gain, gain meaning from other humans, what happens is it's based on three things the words that are said, the tone of voice, and the body language. Of those three, the words that are said are only 7% of the meaning, which quite frankly is why there tends to be a lot of potential issues with just using, for example, email. Tone is 38% and body language is 55%. So what I would say is that if you can't bring, uh, you know, bringing everyone together is ideal, but the problem with that is, is it's expensive. You know, particularly if people are at distance, and it could even be a flight, depending on the state you're in. So again, what I would do is I would say to have video, uh, or if it's if they're a distance, if it's a large state, say like Texas or California or or uh, you know uh, Florida, that's quite long. You know, any anything sort of bigger than Rhode Island. Uh, what you may want to do is rather than get everybody together at one location, have them come together in pods. So, for example, they would come in, uh, everyone in the greater Dallas area would go to somewhere in Dallas. You know, someone near Fort Worth, would, everyone around there would go to Fort Worth, and then have those simulcast in video. Um, that would, that's a better way to do it. It saves people a lot of time. Uh, if you can't do video, then what I would say is that uh, in addition to, you know, uh, then um, if you can't do video, um, then what I would say is have them meet in sections. You would want to give webinars overall to everybody, you know, like to sort of the status piece, but then maybe break them into teams A, B, C, and D, and then it's more work for you, but meet with each of those groups uh, in smaller. So let's say you had 50 people around the state, is to break it into groups of 10, and that you would have, five, you know, you'd have the one webinar where you give everything that's going on and the rules and all that, but then what happens is following that, you do, say, half an hour with each of the five groups. What that does is it, it, it will greatly enhance not only the interpersonal communication between those 10, because there's only 10 people instead of 50. They can start feeling like a subgroup. But also what happens is, is you can concentrate more on their specific questions. Because someone may have a question that you know, three-quarters of the people aren't interested in, and it's really easy then for people to get tuned out. So great, great questions. Forgive me, I'm going to move on. We'd be happy to speak to them uh, afterwards, if, you, if whoever that was, if they thought that, that would be of value. Uh, <clears throat> anyway, next is minimize technical issues. Uh, what I mean by that is that uh, tell people not to put you on hold, because hold a lot has music, and that can just destroy the call. Uh, and second of all is to have everyone put themselves on mute if they're not, um, uh, if they're not specifically talking. Because even if they're just sitting there, you get people tapping the keyboard, someone interrupts someone, you know, people cough, uh, you, you know, just things along that line. So mute is better, you know, come off mute to talk, go on mute to continue. Next is to maximize personal energy. What I would say is, is, is that uh, what you want to do is if you're running it, certainly don't multitask. But as I'm giving this webinar, I'm doing it standing up. You, as I said before, if you remember, 7% for the words, 38 for the tone, 55 for body language. You obviously can't see my body language because I'm not on video. But by doing this standing up, 
what will happen is is some of the uh, it helps my timing. I'm talking with my hands. It's funny. People walking by my offices, they see me doing a webinar. You know, I'm pointing to the screen like it's a person. You know, and uh, I, I sort of look like I'm a little bit, you know, a little bit crazy because I'm moving my hands. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm doing it as if I was presenting in front of a group of people. That helps with my timing. It also gives me more energy. If you want to test this out for yourself. Next time you're home, you're watching TV, you know, you sort of got your feet curled up on the sofa kind of thing, try to sound really excited about saying things. And there'll be an incongruence between your body language and your, uh, between your body language and the words and the excitement you're saying, and it just won't come out the same. Now let me shift gears on you again and start talking about cultural intelligence. What cultural intelligence is, is basically if you have people who are, um, who are virtual, they may be virtual two buildings down, they may be across state, they may be across the country, they may be around the world. So, but and with all of these, you have to be really, really careful as you, the distance expands uh, that you have a good understanding of it. Now, let me also say, by the way, is where this, the information in this section, even if you have a co-located team with nobody virtual, but you have two people from India, you have someone who uh, grew up in China, you have someone who grew up in Boston, someone who grew up in um, um, Indianapolis, uh, you know, as you bring people together, in a physical place, you know, they bring who they are, which is part of a wonderful thing. But as I go to begin this section, I want to begin it with the power of diversity, uh, diversity in the workplace. And by diversity, you know, uh, you know, there's, there's what they call big D and little d. Big D is what you think of as, uh, you know, diversity as in gender or ethnicity. Certainly that's included in it. But what I mean by, by this is people from Boston, people from Texas, people who are baby boomers like myself, people who, are, who just graduated college, uh, people who have degrees in computer science and people who have degrees in liberal arts. The reason is, is because this wider group of people bring different thought and they, address, they, um, they try to solve problems in different ways, etc. And the value of that is enormous to you in trying to solve problems because there's, there's an expression. I forget whose expression it is, but just, I'll just say it's not mine. I can't think of whose it is. But outside-the-box thinking for you might be inside-the-box thinking for other people. Also, if you have people in 10 locations and you don't care where the next one is hired from, Look at the advanced, look at the expanded pool. It's 10 times the size. People in different cities know people that, of course, you don't know. Next is, is when this ties back to one of the first slides that we had regarding multiple, um, multiple countries. Negotiation practices. We're going to talk on that one a little bit later. Uh, for example, hiring and termination. Do you know that if in France, if you, if you lay someone off, you may need to pay them up to 85% of their base pay for as long as three years, depending on the issue. I mean, depending on the reason and the length of time that they were hired. So that's a very, that totally changes your hiring practices. We're in, in versus the United States, you know, you want to be nice and fair to people, but realistically you could give them two to more, more than two weeks. So it's a very, very different plan. The intellectual property laws, just privacy laws, these are things you need to consider when you're working with people in multiple locations. Now these two slides go together. This is actually part of a much longer discussion, but I wanted to give you an inkling of what it is. Is people culturally, and again here, there's no right or wrong, and for those, forgive me if I'm doing a little bit of stereotyping, because you almost have to a little bit to describe it. But what happens is, is you have different cultures tend to look at things differently. You know, the, the first one here, high versus low context. What that means is, is that in high context, that means that, you, that people assume that you know, what's, you know the topic and what's being talked about. Um, for example, Germany, uh, people tend to talk in very high context, assuming that people are, uh, are familiar with the topic at hand. The U.S. tends to be low context, where they, when I talk to someone, I don't assume that they know a lot about the specific topic I'm discussing unless we've discussed it previously. I won't go through them all. There's, there's six of them here, but, you know, like the bottom one, past, present, or future orientation. 
for a future orientation means that you're always looking forward. Entrepreneurs tend to always be looking at the next thing. Countries which are entrepreneurial, which would include, uh, for example, U.S., uh, Israel, um, uh, I think Canada, certain others, uh, other countries tend to think future-based. There's also those that th countries that think in the present, that not really thinking about the past, it's already done, the future will bring what the future brings, what can you do for me today? And then there are those cultures, particularly those that are much older historically. Uh, what they are, they're very, very steeped in tradition. To, to people who are very steeped in tradition, it's much, much harder to get them to change processes, change topics, etc. Um, now, again, there's no right or wrong in any of these, but you need to understand these in order to manage your team. If you're very fast moving and you have people working for you in a country that is very steeped in tradition, it will be much, much harder for you to move them forward at the same rate as countries where it's otherwise. Limit quantity of time, and then I'll let you look at the other two. Oh, actually, I'm going to pick on the bottom one, uh, individual versus collectivism. What that means is, is basically the individual uniqueness is, uh, and self-determination is valued. The other one, collectivism, is where it's the people as a group. So what happens is with individualism, you'll get people saying, yay for me, great, I did well on this project, let me tell you about the great job I did. That actually is looked at as very uh, inappropriate within, within um, cultures that, where collectivism is important. It's the team, it's not the individual. You know, as Tommy Heinsohn said, a, uh, a famous basketball player on the, the Boston Celtics, he said, what, you know, what's more important to you, the name on the front of the jersey, which is the team, or the name on the back of the jersey, which is you? Now, mitigated speech, this is something we have to be really careful of. All of these statements shown on the right mean the same thing. Like if you're in New York, or I'll, I'll say Boston, you want someone to do something, what do you say? do this. Well, depending on where they're from, uh, Asian countries are different with this, uh, European countries are different, everyone has their own, and again, there's no right or wrong, but their own general terminology with how they say things. So being from Boston, if I want you to do something, I'll say do this. But going all the way to the bottom, there are certain other cultures where they would say, I wonder if we should try this. That's a hint, you know, a, a hint that they should do it. What are they really saying? Do this. Or the third one is, is that, um, you know, where it's team, I'm sorry, I'll go with the second one, team obligation. We need to try this. So groups that are very, um, very into collectivism, shown from the previous slide, would be much more likely to say, we need to try this. Why? Because they're looking at it from the team and the group as opposed to the individual. What we have to be careful of here is that we, you know, if I'm, if I'm the kind of person who expects if they want something, me to do something, I say, they tell me, do it. And uh, they're the kind of person who says, I wonder if we should try this. I might say, well, no, nah, good idea, but no, I don't think we should. And then they're mad at me because they were telling me to do it. So it's these types of incommunications can be caused by that. Next, what you have is norms. Um, and what I mean, what I mean by norms <clears throat> is that um, uh, every country has different practices. Actually, when we do this class for private clients, what we do is we actually tie in the specific norms of the different countries. For example, business practices uh, or greetings. Let me pick on that one. In the U.S., this is one that actually people from the, not from the U.S. get confused on is if I, if I meet you, let's say that I've never met, um, well, Brian, I'll pick on Brian. Let's say that he and I never met. Um, and says, Eric, I'd like to introduce, introduce you to Brian. I say, oh, Brian, hi, how are you? Um, I don't, you know, the, the, the turn of phrase, how are you? The answer to that is fine, thank you, nice to meet you. All right. I'm not really asking him how he's doing. You know, it's just the nature of the expression. What happens is, is when people come to the U.S., they're asked a question, they answer it. And many people that I've spoken to, you know, get confused on that because then they say, oh, you know, I'm doing really well, you know, I'm really liking it at the company here and so on. And the other person's like, wow, all right, cool. You know, we're, why are you telling me all this? Um, negotiation. You know, different countries negotiate very, very differently. You know, it's funny. I was doing a private class for a, uh, for a company and they had a, a subsidiary in Italy. And just by chance, one of the people from the Italian subsidiary was in 
their, uh, their office in Connecticut. And what I said is that very often a negotiation trick that's often used in Italy is when the deal is just about together and everything is all set, they come up with this outrageous additional thing that they want to bring into the negotiation. And they do it to try to throw you off a little bit, to try to get a little bit more out of the deal. And then what happens is it sort of works its way back in. In the U.S., we don't do that. So what happens is when you're working, so I said to them, when you're working with your Italian counterparts, who, by the way, were on the phone as I'm doing this, uh, understand that there's the potential. And I said to the folks in the Italian office, you guys are the experts. Do you do this? And what came across the line, they're laughing and they're saying, uh, and they said, yeah, but now you're giving away all of our secrets. In the U.S., we don't negotiate much. When do we negotiate? Jobs, buying cars, buying houses and how much we're going to pay for that nice looking dish at a flea market. You know, we don't do it much. If you don't believe that, next time you go into a Walmart, take a 35 inch TV, bring it up to the cashier. Cashier says it's $350. Look at him or her and say, ah, you know what, I'll give you $250 for it and see how long before you get arrested. But as a result of that is, is that, anyway, these are all different gifts, what you wear. You know, um, in, uh, you know, do you go business casual? Uh, do you go dressed up? You know, what is the culture of not only the com the the, the, the um, of not only the culture of the country that you're working with, but also the office? There are many places in this country where uh, the corporate headquarters wear shirt and tie. You go to the subsidiaries, and they're basically in jeans and t-shirts. And if you walk into one of the subsidiaries with a shirt and tie, they look at it and you say, oh, "Yeah, this guy's from corporate. I wonder what he wants." So it can be looked at from that perspective also. But, you know, so the culture is so, so important. And understanding it can give you enormous, uh, an enormous ability as the manager of a virtual team to be able to properly deal with it. Next is, and this is for the, uh, look at this one from two perspectives. First of all, is from a manager's perspective, these are things you need to do individual contributor's perspective or as a manager who has a boss at another location. These are the things that you have to consider related to your career at the company as a virtual person. <clears throat> One of the most important things, or let me say the list of, of most important things that a manager does is these. Hires new people. Delegates tasks and job assignments to those on their team. Measurement, and what I mean by that is measuring the quality and quantity of the work being performed by the people on their team. I'll come back to that one. Giving people performance reviews, and also just mentoring and career planning. You know, is that on, on the mentoring and career planning, you know, it's funny. When people work in the same location as you, you get to know them a little bit better. You know, you say, oh, what can we do to help your career? You know, uh, uh, you know uh, hey, Brian, I know you, uh, you're, you're interested in doing this kind of thing. I just have a project that opens. Are you interested? When people work virtually, it's really, re really, really easy to pigeonhole them into a specific task that they perform. Oh, whenever we have to do X, we give it to Joe. Could Joe do other things? Sure. Does Joe want to do other things? Most, most definitely. But you wouldn't know that as much. You tend to think of them as a resource performing a specific task. As a result of that, two things happen. One of which is, as a manager, you're not really fulfilling your obligation as their manager regarding mentoring them and helping them with their career planning and professional growth. The other thing you're doing is, is by not providing them mentoring and the ability to grow as a professional. Uh, you know, some people are, are just love what they're doing and want to do exactly that forever. That's wonderful. God bless them. But, you know, if, and if that's the case, you should know that. You should always feed them the same kind of thing. They're a graphic artist. They're not interested in doing anything else. They're just doing web design. Perfect. I'll give you web design. But there are those, for example, who are programmers who want to become business analysts or want to become project managers who, or who want to expand their technical ability to other technologies. Is that if you don't help them move into these as you would if they were local with you, then it's more likely that you'll lose them. Now, cutting back to measurement. Uh, you know, it, and I'm going to talk about baby boomers a little bit. I'm a baby boomer. I, the way that one of the major ways that I was measured earlier in my career particularly 
was how much time did I spend at the office? I mean, I had to do my work and I had to get things done. But, you know, was I a team player, which means I came in at 7 in the morning and left at 7 at night? You know, um, is that sort of time at desk was looked at as, as an important component of showing your worth to the company. <clears throat> Particularly with Gen Yers, you know, millennials, sort of the under 30 crowd. Uh, they're much, much more into life balance than my generation was at the same age. And God bless them. I mean, I think that they're, they're better off for it. Um, but anyway, so that said, um, how do you measure people? If you're not measuring them, now this is whether they're co-located or at distance, but how do, you, um, how do you measure their performance if they're at distance? You can't see them. You don't know how long they're sitting at their desk. So what you have to do is, in order to properly measure them, moving it up one, you have to properly delegate tasks to them that are both measurable and definable where you can measure the quantity and the quality of the work that is performed. So if you want to properly measure your teams, you have to think, well, okay, if this is the per if I'm going to measure this person's whatever it is, how can I do it? And then based on the how is what you delegate. What I'd like to do now is we're about out of time, is I'd like to thank you for hanging with me, spending an hour of your life with me here on the phone is uh, I hope you found it of value uh, and understand that this was sort of a little bit like drinking through a fire hose for you. But, uh, but again, if you want more of this, there's a full day on this topic, the bottom one shown on the left on March 24th. We also have other one-day classes that we offer through, uh, um, that we offer through uh, New Horizons shown on the dates here, Thinking Like a CIO, The Steve Jobs Way. Basically, it's a class on innovation and leadership. You're doing governance. Uh, our next free webinar, as you see, is on February 16th. That's a very important date to me, actually. It's my father's birthday. But, uh, uh, but anyway, we will be talking about uh, IT productivity, uh, building an IT productivity culture, which is actually based on my book, which is coming out uh, approximately that week. On the right, we are offering it next week. This is a class we offer monthly with New Horizons. Uh, it's a certification boot camp for the ITMLP, IT Management and Leadership Professional. It's three days of drinking through a fire hose. As you see on the uh, listed there, there's 10 topics that we cover in three days. Uh, and uh, it's done online. You can uh, basically it would be more of this. Um, I, there'll be, it'd be, it'd be myself or one of my instructors teaching it. You'll see that the fifth one down, fifth or sixth, is managing virtual teams, which is an expanded version. It's not the whole day version, but it's an expanded version of the material we cover today, as well as nine other topics. So from here, what I'd like to do is I'd like to turn it back to Brian if he has any other questions for me. If you have any other questions, it's a good time to type them in. Um, beyond that, I'd like to thank you for, uh, again, for spending an hour of your life with me, and thank you to Brian and New Horizons for hosting our monthly webinar. Brian, back to you. Cool. And we'd like to thank you, Eric, for taking time out of your day to present for us. Um, we really do appreciate it from New Horizons, and I'm sure I speak for everybody who attended. I thought it was absolutely great. And, uh, you know, thank you from, from all of us who had the opportunity to listen in. Um, I'll give it another second here for any new questions to come in. We covered a few during the session. I'm going to make sure nobody else has anything before we close out for the day. Um, and... I don't see anything coming in. So thank you everyone for, that attended the webinar and thank you, Eric, for your time and the great presentation as always. And um, we'll go ahead and, and be here. Thank you, sir. And I'll have a good day.